Hi, Mike Amundsen here, and I want to talk to you about designing and building great web APIs. And today, a really important topic, and that is the API story. What's an API story? Where does it come from? Why do we need it? That's what we'll talk about. And I'll give you four really easy steps for creating great API stories that you can use for all your APIs. So first of all, what does an API story look like? Basically, it looks something like this. If you're familiar with the idea of user stories or other things that's similar to that, uh, this is really, really close. The way I think about API stories is I think about them in a multi-step process. So there's the idea of a purpose. Usually a purpose is a really simple statement. Why do we have this API? What's it here for? So that's simple. We keep track, in this case, of companies for big, big co-incorporated. And then we have to talk about the data. So what, what are the data collection names? We, this is all done in a sort of a, you know, a conversational style, street address, postal code, cities, telephone, email, things like that. Uh, we even talk a little bit about the notion of status values and what are enumerated. And then we also talk about actions. So data is really important, but the more important element is action. What are the actions we're going to do with this API? So you can see if you read through this list, typical things like we're going to be listing records, reading a single record, creating, updating, deleting, filtering, setting the status for a record. That's really important. So those are the three key elements, purpose, data, and actions. There are two other elements that you might have, and that's processing. So if there's any special processing that has to go on inside the API, not on the service, mind you, but inside the API, then that's done here. For example, this one has a little story about how we create unique IDs for every company that we add to the system. So that's important to mark that down. There may also be some rules. I don't have a rules section in this one. Processing and rules are optional. Rules are actually things like you can't have more than two records with the same name. Uh, you can't add a record that doesn't have certain fields in it. You can't have a record uh, that is missing certain data or data above and below certain values, things like that. So those are rules about the interface. Remember, we're doing the API story, not the service story. So that's the first step, purpose, data, actions, and processing. Where do we get this information? Where does it come from? Typically, you get it from some kind of forms or inputs or discussions. In another course that I've, I've done a few years ago about web design, I talked about actually interviewing stakeholders and collecting that information. So here's an example of what we talked about earlier. Company name, address, telephone, email. Uh, there's that company ID. Remember, it's got some kind of code or some setup as to how the company ID is created. When it was created, and notice that company status that has some values. So I might get this in a form that somebody sends me. I might be sent to a web page. That's information that I collect up. And then I collect up that information, and I turn that into something called a vocabulary table or a vocabulary record. So that means I identify all of the key elements, all of the data elements, and all the action elements for this interface. Notice some of the elements uh, for the data elements did not appear in any of the interview notes. For instance, company ID is something I added. Date created, date updated. There may be some things that you add to the vocabulary list uh, that you're going to need and actually make the API work well that didn't come up when users were talking about it. Machines think, need some things that humans don't. Then in the action elements, I have list, create, read, update, and you can see that I have arguments now. I have other parts of the data vocabulary or the properties that are included in each action. So in create, you have to have certain things. So some of these actually say R's next to them. That means they're required. Some of them have something in parentheses. That means there's a default value. So uh, when we add a, uh, a record for status, it's required, or if you don't give it, it's going to be pending, and so on and so forth. So that vocabulary item is really important. We derive that directly from the conversation we had with the uh, users or the stakeholders when we built that story. That's why it's so important when we come up to the story. So what does that happen to that vocabulary? We actually turn that vocabulary into a workflow document. This workflow document actually talks a lot about how you move from step to step. You, you might have lots of different kinds of workflow documents in your organization. You may have UML diagrams, you may have class diagrams, actor diagrams, um, finite state diagrams, so on and so forth. I like to use just sort of a simple kind of sequential diagram that talks about uh, a state you're moving to, uh, you're starting from and moving to, and what that state labeling is and whether or not any arguments can be included with it. So you can see this, how this kind of plays out. And what I do is I write this in a language you might recognize here called Web Sequence Diagramming Language, or WSD. The WSD language can actually be processed into a physical diagram, an actual uh, diagram, and that's what you see here. So we actually we have this, these sort of pills that are on the top, home, list, filter, read, update, delete, 
create. They sort of represent states of things. And if you drill in, you can actually see the names of how you get from one state to the next. To get from home to list, I'm going to navigate a thing called collection. To get from list back to home, I'm going to navigate to a thing called home. This will come in handy when we talk about actions, if we're doing um, gRPC, or uh, hypermedia controls, if we're doing uh, hypermedia REST web APIs. So here you can see other things where we can send arguments uh, as well. You talk about create, all the arguments they're going to send along. So this diagram comes directly from this flow diagram that's written in WSD language. We'll talk a little bit in another episode about how to actually write the WSD generated. I've got a nice little command line utility that generates the PNG files from the WSD files. And this WSD comes directly from this uh, vocabulary. This vocabulary is pretty, uh, pretty involved. We'll talk about this vocabulary in another episode. You want to normalize this vocabulary against your own system uh, dictionary or ontologies inside your organization. We'll talk about how that works. Vocabulary comes from our forms. Our forms actually uh, also generate our story documents as well. So having an API story is critical because this is a document that you can pass around to lots of people. It helps you generate your vocabulary, helps you generate your diagrams, your workflows, all the other elements. And that's how you do API stories when you're designing and building great web APIs. Now check the bug at the top. There are lots more episodes in this series, and I'll see you another uh, time soon. And help, good luck designing and building great web